مرحبا انا الدكتور مصعب عطفي طبيب قلبيه في الولايات المتحده الامريكيه راح فيكم بالميتنج اليوم رح نتحدث عن ايوتيك ستينوسس تضيق الدسام التاجي بك سم التاجي فنحن نحكي عن الاعراض والتشخيص والطرق المعالجه مثل ما بتعرفوا انه في اربع دسامات في القلب الدسام التاجي الابهري عفوا عفوا الابهري هو الاورتيك ستينوسس هيك التاجي هو المايترا هيك هيك بسموه الترايكوسبي رح احكي اذا ف... اذا ما في مانع عندكم ب... رح احكي بالانجليزي عشان ما خربت شوي بالمصطلحات فالايورتيك مايترال تريكوسبيد اند بومونيك فالف As you know, every valve is like a door. It's open and closed. And it's tough to have sick here. You kill a cardiac cycle. So you can imagine over the year how many times it works. So in the effect of the valve, it's a kind of trauma in the valve. And it leads to the rest of the calcium in the valve. And it leads to the rest of the cell. رح نحكي عن السيمتوم بتفصيل بالسلايد الثاني ما هي الريسك فاكتورز او العوامل اللي بتؤدي الى حدوث التضيق الاسام الابهري الايج هو التضيق الاسام الابهري is much more common in elderly patients the prevalence will increase مع تقدم العمر العمر اللي اكثر من 65 سنه الميل جندر ميل تو فيميل اولموست لايك 3 تو 1 اور 4 تو 1 هايبر تنشن سموكينج اليفيتد لايبو بروتين اتس فاز فاوند انه ايفن اليفيتد اللايبو بروتين اي انكريز ذا ريسك اوف ايرتيك ستينوسس اليفيتد ال دي ال كوليسترول سو ذوز ار كان اوف ريسك فاكتور There is three major, يعني ثلاث أسباب رئيسية لتضيق التسام الأبهري. The most common هي the age-related calcific aortic stenosis. يعني تضيق التسام بسبب العمر بسبب يعني استهلاك أو استعمال التسام بشكل بديل و. والترسب الكالسيوم فيه بنسميه باللغه الانجليزيه ديجنريتيف كالسيفيك ايوتيك ستينوسس ديجنريتيف كالسيفيك ايوتيك ستينوسس النوع الثاني اللي هلا قل كثير هو الروماتيك فيفر من تقريبا 30 40 سنه كان فيري كومن بالميدل ايست بس هلا بعتقد انه خف كثير الاكثر دسامات اصابه فيه هو الدسام المايترو مايترو فالف بس كمان الدسام الابهري او الايوتيك فالف كان بي افكتد وذ روماتيك فيفر السبب الثالث هو الكونجنتال ابنورماليتي والموست كومن اوف ذيم از باي كاسبيد ايوتيك فالف باي كاسبيد يعني الفالف اللي له تو كاسب او ثري كاسب فحسب الايج اكثر شيء ال الكونجنتال بتشوفوه بالاعمار اللي اصغر، يعني عادة المرضى اللي بيكونوا في ال 40 او 50 او 60 عندهم تضيق بالدسام غالبا بيكون بسبب كونجنتال اكثر من ما يكون كالسيفيك ديجنريتيف ايورتيك ستيروسيس. بينما اللي اعمارهم متقدمة غالبا بيكون بسبب الديجنريتيف كالسيفيك ايورتيك ستيروسيس. Uh, aortic stenosis uh, is a very serious condition, uh, especially in advanced stage. You might be seeing the problem in the mother. We call the prognosis of a few say is a matter of life. Of course, is it without a life? The chart here, the slide, I'm sure you can know. We mother the patient in a very long time. There is no condition. لحتى يوصل لكريتيكال بوينت لما بتبدا الاعراض بتتسارع الاعراض بشكل كثير كبير 
بحيث انه اللايف اكسبكتنسي بتكون اقصر بكثير من وقت بدايه الاعراض اذا ما تعالج طبعا طبعا هذا الحكي اذا ما تعالج ف مثل ما شايفين السرفايفل افتر اونست اوف سيمتومز از 50% ات 2 ييرز يعني بعد سنتين من بدايه الاعراض 50% اوف ذا بيشنت ويل داي And uh, 20% at five years. يعني بعد خمس سنين من بداية الأعراض, only 20% of the patients still alive. طبعاً, this is is a is a. ما كان في معالجة. طبعاً, المعالجة اللي هتغير ال equation يعني. بس إذا ما تعالج المريض هاي ال outcome. رح نحكي شوي عن الابيديميولوجي تبع الايوتيك فاب ستينوسس يعني انتشاره ففي الولايات المتحده الامريكيه حوالي 2.5 مليون شخص اوفر ذا ايج اوف 75 سفر فروم ذيس ديزيز سو اتس فيري هاي بريفلنس لايك فور ايج اوفر 75 12.5% اوف ذا بوبليشن هاز سم ديجري اوف ايوتيك ستينوسس And uh, as you know, كما يعني مثل ما تعرفوا إنه بالمجتمعات الغربية نسبة المسنين نسبة الناس اللي متقدمين في العمر عم تزيد بشكل كبير المجتمع يعني بسموها مجتمعات كهلة. Uh, 80% من الأدولت اللي عندهم symptomatic aortic stenosis are male. Uh, مثل ما حكينا إنه it's more common in male than female. إذا قارنا الأيورتيك ستينوزيس بكثير من الأمراض الثانية اللي خطرة كثير مثل مثلا بريست كانسر، لونج كانسر، كولوركتيف كانسر، بروستيف كانسر، أوبيريان كانسر إذا إذا المريض ما تعالج يعني untreated untreated أيورتيك ستينوزيس البروجنوزيس تبعهم is much worse than a lot of cancers. So it's a very serious disease that should not be ignored. So, uh, how we diagnose aortic stenosis? The three, يعني, three major important things is the history, physical exam, and echocardiogram. Those, those, fact, those uh, uh, tools will help in the diagnosis as well as the uh, uh, evaluation of the severity of aortic stenosis. By history, يعني بالقصة السريرية الأعراض تبع الأيورتيك ستينوسيس غالبا يعني ثلاث ميجر ثري ميجر سيمتومز شورتنس أوف بريث أور هارت فيلير ديزنس أند بري سينكوبي أور سينكوبي أند تشيست بين أور أنجينا بالنسبة للشورتنس أوف بريث في بداية الأعراض بيكون المريض عنده شورتنس أوف بريث غالبا إكزيرشنال Uh, it can progressive from uh, moderate activity to mild activity. In the beginning of the aortic stenosis, the ejection fraction of SATA is well preserved, yani ejection fraction over 50%. But, uh, you know, as the disease progresses, if it's not treated, uh, the, the patient goes to a low ejection fraction heart failure. Uh, and there is a true a lot of congestive heart failure, including shortness of breath, even at rest, PND or apnea, uh, pedal edema, and uh, all of their symptoms. Uh, dizziness and syncope are uh, considered a very serious uh, symptom, and uh, patients should be really uh, evaluated immediately with, with this symptom. When I'm talking about dizziness and syncope, it's specifically exertion. If someone tells you that they uh, or doing some work and they get very dizzy or about to faint, uh, yani this is the time to really uh, evaluate the patient very seriously. Uh, chest pain or angina is the supply demand mismatch. Hatta al ma ma'andu coronary artery disease, mungkin yisiyan andu chest pain or angina be severe aortic stenosis because of the supply demand mismatch. Because uh, of the aortic stenosis, because of the left ventricular hypertrophy, the other one is أو وبسبب إنه جهد الكبير اللي بتعمل العضلة القلبية يعني left ventricle 
uh, work harder to push the blood across the stenotic valve, so uh, increase the demand for oxygen. We saw a decrease in cardiac output will uh, flow across the aortic valve because it decreased supply. Uh, it's a supply demand mismatch. Yeah. But a lot of time, coronary artery disease can be associated with coronary artery disease, and that makes uh, chest pain worse. So sometimes patient who has moderate coronary artery disease, which usually could be asymptomatic, becomes symptomatic in the presence of severe aortic stenosis. عفوا بس حابب اسال الحضور بالنسبه للغه الانجليزيه في مشكله؟ ما سمعت الريسبونس بس اوكي رح تكون ميوتد لانه اذا بدكم تجاوبوا بدكم ان ميوت اذا تريدوا اه عفوا في مشكلة بالنسبة للغة الإنجليزية يمكن يعني ولا أحيانا المصطلحات أسهل شوية من أعد اللغة الإنجليزية طيب رح كمل uh, بالفيزيكال إكزام البيشن وذ سيفير أيرتيك ستينوزيز ذا موست يو نو كومن فايندينغ أوف فيزيكال إكزام إز هارت مارمر ذا كواليتي أوف ذا هارت مارمر إز سيستوليك إيجكشن مارمر systolic injection murmur, usually in the aortic area and left upper sternal border. Uh, the murmur can be graded from, you know, level two or, I mean, two over six or three over six or four over six, uh, you know how to grade the murmur. And uh, it radiates to the neck sometime, it radiates to the uh, apex sometime. Um, but one thing I want to say about heart murmur the heart murmur can be very loud in a patient who has very, very good ventricle, good ejection fraction. But as the disease progresses, when the patient comes present with severe heart failure, with diastolic heart, with the systolic heart failure, ejection fraction is very low, then the murmur becomes fainter. The reason, yeah, it's called a khafil murmur. The sabab in no qadrit al adal al qalbi, the left ventricle, and no push the blood across the stenotic valve. It's going to be less. For that, the murmur will be less. From the Arab, from the finding of the other, in terms of the physical exam, the hypotension. The hypotension you see it only in severe aortic stenosis, really severe aortic stenosis, where the cardiac output or the blood flow is significantly diminished. So, hypotension is one of the signs. Uh, and the patient actually, that's one of the reason why the patient gets uh, sometimes dizzy and uh, lightheaded. And but then, and in the physical finding, he is finding of congestive heart failure findings, like uh, in the lungs, rails, uh, evidence of uh, uh, fluid overload, uh, pedal edema. Uh, third mo most important uh, uh, tool for diagnosing aortic stenosis, the echocardiogram. Echocardiogram is really the gold standard for evaluation of the aortic valve stenosis. Uh, on the echo, the thing that we uh, need to uh, watch, uh, see the aortic valve calcification and the cusp opening and closing. So uh, you have to pay attention specifically to the aortic valve calcification, the amount of calcification. You, can, you have to see it in multiple view, in the long axis view, in the short uh, axis view where you see the valve uh, right on, you know. So you see the, uh, the Mercedes sign, you know, on the aortic valve opening and closing. You see the calcification. You see how the uh, cusp is opening. And if you have a very good echo, you can even uh, do planimetry on the opening of the aortic valve and measure the uh, aortic valve opening by planimetry. الشغلات الثانية اللي بتطلع عليها بالإيكو aortic valve flow velocity B max هلا فرجيكم بعد example أنتم كمان يعني كمان تعلمون لما بيكون في flow through a stenotic area this the the velocity of the flow is increased and that's the principle of measuring the flow velocity uh, aortic valve gradient, the pressure gradient between the left ventricle and uh, the aorta. Left ventricular size and function, ejection fraction. 
uh, as I said, in the uh, beginning of uh, the disease or the beginning of symptoms, usually ejection fraction is, is preserved. Yeah, it's been over 50%. Uh, and as the disease progress, you know, the ejection fraction drops and the patient goes to complete heart failure. Uh, measure, measurement of the aortic valve area. The aortic valve area can be measured as a calculation from different uh, hemodynamic uh, or uh, parameter on the echo or directly by planimetry. And also, uh, you have to look at the other valves because aortic stenosis, a lot of time, is associated with other valvular abnormalities. For example, in rheumatic uh, aortic stenosis, uh, by the way, in rheumatic fever, there is more aortic regurgitation than stenosis. But in rheumatic uh, heart disease, uh, the involvement of the mitral valve is very, very common. Uh, you look also at the tricuspid valve. The, the reason it's very important because the symptoms of the patient may not be uh, only due to aortic stenosis. So, for example, if he has uh, severe aortic stenosis and very severe MR, uh, you have to address the mitral regurgitation at the same time as addressing the aortic stenosis. The criteria for severe aortic stenosis, and if you will, um, the severity of the aortic stenosis criteria. Uh, the criteria are uh, the guideline and then the Vmax, which is the flow velocity across the aortic valve, uh, four or equal or more than four, so equal or more than four meter per second, mean gradient more than 40, or more or equal to 40 millimeter of mercury, and aortic valve area less than or equal to one square centimeter. So those are the uh, criteria for diagnosing severe aortic stenosis. As far as the gradient and the Vmax, usually those criteria apply for patients with uh, preserved ejection fraction. Uh, as we're going to see in the next slide, sometimes those numbers may not be uh, as high in a patient with low ejection fraction. So I'm going to show you an, a, uh, an example of a short axis view of the aortic valve. This is a normal valve. This is a valve, healthy valve. You see how it is open. I don't know if you can see it very well. The cusp open during uh, diastole. Uh, the valve is closed, and you see it like a Mercedes sign, the called Mercedes sign. And then when it's open, and the leaflet open altogether, it becomes like a triangle, triangle shape. So this is a normal valve. The next one is a severely stenotic valve. Look at the amount of calcium. The white is the calcium. Look at the cost of the aortic valve is not moving much at all, barely moving. You can see the difference, there. Right? You remember we talked about the doubler, the doubler measurement in the echo. Now, the doubler, we measure by doubler, we measure the flow velocity. If you see that uh, envelope below the line, that's the flow velocity. And on the side, you see the, uh, the grade two meter per second, four meter per second. So you see here, the patient has a flow velocity over four meter per second. The mean gradient is 44.8, almost 45, and peak gradient was 65. So this is severe aortic stenosis. The calculated aortic valve area, there's two methods of calculation. One give you 0.74 square centimeter, one give you 0.67 square centimeter. By the way, you know, it, it's, uh, it's been reported that the aortic valve area may not always correlate very well with the uh, gradient. Uh, they took one square centimeter as a cutoff for the severe stenosis because of the uh, prognostic uh, finding. However, usually in a normal ventricle, the one square centimeter correlates with a mean gradient in the like 30, in the mid 30s, like 35 percent. So uh, usually, when you see a patient with the mean gradient over 40, usually the valve area less than one. Now, as you know, on, uh, above the line, if you see above the line, uh, there is uh, aortic regurgitation in this patient. You see the aortic regurgitation uh, flow above the line during uh, diastole. 
This is another example. This patient has a worse aortic stenosis than the previous patient. This is what you call a critical aortic stenosis here. You see the flow velocity is 5.25 meter per second. The mean gradient is 75 millimeter of mercury. The value is about 0.5 square centimeter. This is a critical aortic stenosis. Uh, by the way, we talk about uh, aortic valve area as one or less than one square centimeter. Uh, alternatively, you can take what you call aortic valve area index, aortic valve area index, which is taking the aortic valve area and dividing it by the body surface area. The reason why it's very important is sometimes if you have a very small patient, like a very tiny old lady, has a very low uh, body surface area, uh, when she, if she has uh, one square centimeter valve area, the valve index may be 0.8 or 0.9, which indicate only moderate aortic stenosis. So, uh, so the, for average, average patient is one square centimeter or less, is considered severe, but you have to take into account uh, the size of the patient and the body surface area. So in the criteria say that aortic valve area one square centimeter or less or for aortic valve area index 0.6 square centimeter per meter square. So you remember we talk about the criteria, the three major criteria, the uh, big velocity, mean gradient, and aortic valve area. Now, we, uh, sometimes we face with a, a situation where a patient has severe aortic valve stenosis, but has low flow, low gradient. And as I said, the United States of America is a abbreviation here for the classic low flow LF, LG, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. The juvenile the valve area one or less square centimeter or aortic valve area index less than uh, 0 0.6 uh, square centimeter. But the mean average gradient, uh, the mean uh, aortic valve gradient is less than 40. Those patients have low flow, so stroke volume index. Stroke volume index, it means the amount of blood that ejected every heartbeat from the ventricle to the aorta. That's stroke volume, it's called stroke volume. Index meaning you index it to the uh, body surface area. So if your stroke volume index less than 35, we consider that low flow, low flow, okay? So in those patients, usually the classic low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis has a low ejection fraction, less than 50%. So those patients, Usually, the mechanism is the, the ventricle is failing, the ventricle is weak, it's unable to push the blood to the aorta. So the, uh, so the uh, amount of blood flowing to the aorta decreases, and the velocity decreases. So that's why you see those findings. I, I'll show you in the next slide, or next couple of slides, uh, how, you will, how you evaluate those patients to make sure they have really severe aortic stenosis. A second type of low gradient severe aortic stenosis, what we call paradoxical, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. Again, valve area horn, uh, less, than one, less, less or equal to one square centimeter, valve area index less or equal to 0.6 uh, square centimeter per, meet, per meter square. And the mean gradient here less than 40, the same thing, the stroke volume index less than 35 uh, cc. So they have low flow, okay? They have low flow and low gradient, but the only difference here is ejection fraction over 50%. So we're gonna see how we interpret this uh, finding. Why would you have uh, severe aortic stenosis with low gradient and low flow in a patient who has normal ejection fraction. In the first group we talk about the reason is weak heart muscle, inability to push the blood. In the second one, the ejection fraction is still normal. So that's why they call it paradoxical. Um, and the third type is uh, normal flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, and ejection fraction usually over 50%.
So they said about 50% of aortic stenosis may be in that category, low gradient severe aortic stenosis. All the three categories together, um, about 50% of aortic stenosis might be in that category. Uh, we talk about the classic low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis. That's the one where ejection fraction is low. So one of the tests you can do to uncover whether the patient has a truly severe aortic stenosis or not, doing the butamine stress echo, the butamine stress echo. So what we do is we infuse the butamine. We start with 10 microgram and we increase to 20 and uh, they used to say only 20, now they say up to 30. And we'll see if the uh, ventricle contractility improve. We'll see if the gradient increase and the Vmax increase. So the, res the response number one is if you do the dobutamine and you see increasing in the aortic valve gradient, uh, it will go over 40, which is a criteria that we talk about, or Vmax over 4. And the valve area remain uh, le uh, one or less uh, uh, square centimeter. So that really indicates that this patient truly has severe aortic stenosis. Okay, so the dubutamine echo here uh, confirmed that the patient has severe aortic stenosis. Response number two is very important to pay attention to that. Now, uh, in this response, what happened is the aortic valve area actually increased after the dubutamine. So you give dubutamine the valve area increased, and the mean gradient remained low, below 40. So those what we call pseudo-severe aortic stenosis. This is an important one to differentiate. Uh, as you know, when you have a very weak heart muscle, the heart muscle contractility and pushing the blood is not strong enough to open the aortic valve cusp. So the aortic valve cusp is not completely open, not because it's stenotic, because the flow is very low. So those patients sometimes give the appearance of having severe aortic valve stenosis. But when you do the butamine echo on them, you see that the valve area was increasing ejection fraction, improving LV function with the butamine. The valve area actually improved. That means that the valve is not restricted. It's open when the flow increased, the valve opened up. So those, this is a very important one to differentiate because you don't want to put a new, a new valve or prosthetic valve in a patient who has pseudo-severe aortic stenosis. So uh, pay attention to that one. So the second uh, possible response on the vitamin stress echo is increased aortic valve area and uh, the gradients remain low. Those patients do not have a severe aortic stenosis. They may have maybe moderate, but it's not severe. The uh, response number three, where you have kind of like ambiguous, any mukti welcome component in the response, the aortic valve uh, gradient still below 40, but command an aortic valve area still less than one square centimeter. In those patients, you have to go to a second method of assessing the severity is aortic valve calcium score. We're going to talk about that. Aortic valve calcium score help if the calcium score is high, uh, as we're going to say, uh, as we're going to see in the next slide, then uh, that may indicate severe aortic stenosis. The other thing that we uh, check with the uh, dobutamine stress echo is how the ventricle, how, how much the ventricle improve with dobutamine. If the ejection fraction uh, improved, uh, then uh, usually indicate that the patient has reserve, has a good uh, reserve. Uh, if that does not improve at all or improve very little, that means that the patient has a, you know, what you call burnout ventricle. If the patient has severe aortic stenosis for a very long time or has cardiomyopathy for other reasons, not just aortic stenosis, uh, the, the ventricle may get to the point where uh, giving the vitamin does not even help at all the ejection fraction. So in those patients, in those patients, um, usually replacing the valve sometimes really doesn't work very well, and they usually have very, very poor prognosis. So let's talk about the paradoxical uh, low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis. This group, as I mentioned to you, the ejection fraction is still preserved over 50%, over or equal to 50%. 
So what is the cause of that low flow? Uh, one of the causes is uh, significant concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with a small cavity. The cavity of the left ventricle is very small. The ventricle is very thick. Uh, and those patients have very low volume in the ventricle. So when they, uh, the ventricle contract, the amount of blood pushed, you know, the stroke volume is very low because the amount of blood pushed through the valve is low. So even though the patient has normal ejection fraction, but the ventricle cavity is very small and the amount of blood uh, uh, pushed every cycle is uh, less than the normal amount. Uh, other conditions, severe and controlled hypertension. As you know, high, severe hypertension is a severe afterload uh, increase in the afterload, right? So when the, when the ventricle has to push the blood uh, through the aortic valve, it has another obstacle is a severe hypertension. So uh, because of that, it makes it, it, make, it makes it harder for the ventricle to push the blood through the valve, even though the ventricle ejection fraction is okay. So the flow through the valve will decrease or diminish. So in this case, we can see the paradoxical low flow, low gradient cigarette stenosis. Atrial fibrillation also decreased the cardiac output sometime and decreased the amount of blood flow. So you could see that condition in AFib, especially if uh, AFib is not controlled rate, you know, the heart rate is not well controlled. We see it also in severe mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis or tricuspid regurgitation or RV dysfunction. The mechanism uh, in all those cases, you know, severe MR, MS, TR, or RV dysfunction is decreased cardiac output. When the ventricle contracts, a lot of the blood go to the atrium rather than going through the aortic valve to the aorta. So in the severe MR, MS, TR, or RV dysfunction, um, the mechanism is decreased cardiac output, decreased forward blood flow through the aortic valve. In MR, like I told you, the blood is going to the left atrium rather than to the, through the valve. So the amount of blood going through the valve is decreased, so you have low flow. That's the definition of low flow. Mitral stenosis is the same thing. The amount of blood go from the left atrium to the uh, uh, LV diminished, the cardiac output decreased, so the amount of blood pushed through the aortic valve is also diminished, so that's low flow. Tricuspid valve regurgitation and RV dysfunction cause decreased cardiac output because the amount of blood reached the left ventricle is also diminished. So the amount of blood pushed through the valve is diminished with definition of low flow. Uh, it has been reported now about 10 to 20 percent of this, uh, this type of uh, paradoxical low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis may have uh, some sort of uh, amyloidosis the wild type uh, ATTR amyloidosis, which fortunately uh, there's a new medication right now to treat this uh, type. So uh, it's important to uh, to consider that uh, as a uh, one of the uh, potential reasons for this condition uh, because it's treatable at this point. Uh, in those patients now, the one who have paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis, if you suspect if you see the valve is heavily calcified, it's not opening up, the valve area is, uh, is low, below uh, one square centimeter, and the flow and the gradient is still low, you can depend on the uh, AV calcium score in this uh, situation to confirm the severity of aortic stenosis. So what is the AV calcium score? Uh, usually we get it from the CT scan, we do a CT scan for the uh, heart, and we ask the radiologist to calculate uh, aortic valve calcium score, and uh, that consider a secondary criteria for uh, aortic stenosis. The score of more than 1,200 units in women and more than 2,000 units in men indicates severe aortic stenosis. Okay. So now we're going to talk about treatment. Uh, medical therapy, as you see here, a bag of uh, all kind of medication is all in the garbage because medical therapy does not uh, cure aortic stenosis. That doesn't mean that you cannot treat patients with heart failure, with aortic stenosis or uh, uh, 
hypertension is aortic stenosis medication. No, I don't mean that. I mean that there is no medical treatment to relieve aortic stenosis, to change the aortic stenosis. So if you're giving the patient diuretics or uh, the blocker or any medication, you are trying to uh, relieve some of the symptoms, some of the concomitant uh, pathology, uh, pathological condition. But there's no treatment, medical treatment, to relieve the aortic stenosis. Uh, many years ago, they thought about opening the valve with a balloon. So we did that actually over 30, 40, 30 years ago. We put a balloon, inflate it across the valve, try to crack open the valve, you know, try to open some of the calcium and open the valve. It works. It works fine. Uh, a lot of time, but it's only temporary. It's a matter of a few months, the stenosis come back again. So that was, at that time, standalone aortic valve, uh, valvuloplasty. Uh, right now, uh, this, the aortic balloon valvuloplasty is used as a palliative therapy for patients who cannot have any sort of like end-stage cancer disease, patients who have very low survival uh, uh, prospect for a year. So those will give them like a palliative therapy with aortic balloon valvuloplasty, and we use it during uh, TAVR, as, as you will see later, to open up a little bit the severe aortic stenosis to make the deployment of the aortic valve, uh, the new aortic valve, prosthetic valve, easier. So uh, other modality of treatment is uh, surgery, surgical aortic valve replacement, TAVR. Uh, Surgery for a long time has been the gold standard for treatment of aortic valve stenosis. And um, that requires, of course, open heart surgery. The patient has to be in cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, there is multiple approach, you know, a full sternotomy, uh, like you see in this one. You have a minimally invasive one, right anterior thoracotomy, and minima, minimal uh, sternotomy. So the, the surgeon themselves, they try to evolve and develop less aggressive treatment, as you see all this uh, different modality, but all of them require that the patient go on uh, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. And uh, it means that you have to remove the, uh, uh, the malfunctioning aortic valve and put a new one. There's many valve uh, available uh, there is mechanical, and mechanical, like fine mechanical, that has uh, longer durab durability. However, the patient would require to be on impact coagulation the rest of their life. So usually we'll put mechanical aortic valve in patients who are very young because, uh, you know, this valve is uh, much more durable. It can last 20 or more, 30 years. Uh, so if you're putting... In a valve in a patient who is uh, like 40 or 50 year old, like in the bicuspid valve, if you put a, a bioprosthetic valve, those valves deteriorate rapidly, especially in young people. Young people have a progression of the disease in the uh, bioprosthetic valve faster than older patients. So in those patients, uh, the answer is to put a mechanical uh, prosthesis. Uh, in older patients, we put a bioprosthetic valve. Bioprosthetic means a valve that's prepared usually from the pericardium of the cow or the pig. Um, the cow uh, valve, we call it bovine valve. The pig valve, we call it uh, a borsine valve. There is different design of this aortic valve, uh, so I'm not going to bore you with that, you know, surgical valve. So the, uh, the most recent modality of treatment for aortic valve stenosis is a transcatheter aortic valve replacement, TAVR. And this has been uh, evolving and increasing significantly. It's been established now in the United States and many countries as uh, probably uh, the first line of treatment in many patients, not in every patient, for severe aortic stenosis. So right now, uh, this procedure uh, is minimally invasive. Uh, it requires uh, putting a large catheter through the femoral artery usually. We have sometimes alternative access. We, if we, the femoral artery is not available, we can maybe use subclavian or carotid. Uh, 
a few years ago, they were doing transepical. It means that if you have no vascular access, you can, uh, the surgeon try to make a little cut and go through the apex of the ventricle, but right now it's very rare to use that. So it's a least invasive procedure for valve replacement, does not require a patient to go on heart-lung machine. So as you, you'll see in the video, the patient can have this procedure with a beating heart, the heart still beating. Of course, during the deployment of the valve, you uh, have to kind of make the heart beat very weak so the valve doesn't move. Okay, we'll show that. And usually, it, of course, all the, all the uh, prosthetic valve in this situation is by a prosthetic valve because you cannot squeeze a metal <laughs> into the, over the balloon. So it's all by a prosthetic valve. Uh, and usually the transfemoral approach is the most common. Uh, as I told you before, there's two companies right now in the United States that approved for this uh, valve. Uh, Edward uh, Life Science, they have uh, Edward Sabian valve, which is a, a balloon expandable valve. So the valve is mounted on a balloon can crump on the balloon. When you go across the valve and you deploy it, you have to inflate the balloon to deploy the valve. So that's balloon expandable valve. It's stainless steel frame. And it has a skirt you know, in the bottom to prevent the paravalvular leak. This uh, uh, tissue in the valve is a bovine tissue from the cow, the pericardium of the cow. The other company is Metronic, Metronic Evolute uh, Pro Core Valve. This one is a uh, nitinol, nitinol stent, and it's uh, self-expanding. So you remove the sheet and the, 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 uh, and the, and the stent expand and deploy the valve. Uh, this is a porcine valve. This is a, uh, come from the pig, from the pig pericardium. Um, so, that the the uh, the principle of the tavern, the, the principle is to to suture the valve or mount the valve on a stent, either the self ex, uh, expanding stent like in Metronic or the balloon expandable stent in Edward. So you are suturing the valve inside the stent. So the the, the, the valve is held by the stent, and the principle of that is when you put that new valve, you push the old valve aside and you you sit in the place. The only way for this valve to stay in place is the presence of calcium. So if you don't have calcification of the aortic valve, this valve will fly, will not stay in place. So this is only approved for severe calcific degenerative aortic stenosis. So you have to have calcium, the calcium which really hold the uh, valve in place, okay? It, uh, it will hang on that uh, strut of the stand and keep it uh, uh, in place. Uh, so the current current indication for TAVR, as approved by uh, you know the guideline in the United States, severe and symptomatic aortic stenosis, severe and symptomatic aortic stenosis, and uh, every single patient uh, now uh, goes through what we call a valve clinic evaluation. So the concept of what we develop is called heart team or valve team. Uh, you know, uh, consists of uh, cardiothoracic surgeon and interventional uh, or structural cardiologist. And usually it's uh, the decision about what kind of procedure to have and what uh, the best option for the patient is a share, what you call shared decision. It means a collective decision, a group decision, not a single person decision. So usually we send this patient, we do all the workup on them, and then we discuss them in our meeting. We have a meeting every week. Uh, we discuss all the cases, we review all the data, and we make a, a, a collective decision. So every patient going to TAVR usually have to go through this process. Uh, usually we do the procedure in hybrid OR or hybrid cath lab. I mean hybrid, it means that the, the room can be converted to OR immediately. That's what means hybrid. Uh, so maybe this is some repetition. Uh, in terms of anesthesia, those patients, uh, initially we did give them all general anesthesia in the beginning of the uh, 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 development of this procedure. However, right now, about 90% plus of this patient 
uh, only have moderate sedation by the anesthesiologist. So they give make them uh, so light sleep without intubation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the mechanism, you put the valve inside the uh, native valve and you open it up so you push the native valve to the side. And the way this valve stay in place is by calcium. Okay, so uh, what is the risk of the TAVR? I mean, is TAVR like a procedure without risk? No, of course, any procedure, any surgical is considered, you know, semi-surgical procedure has risk, you know, risk of uh, death, stroke, vascular injury, bleeding, pacemaker requirement, uh, kidney injury, and uh, rarely conversion to open heart surgery. Now, uh, the incidence of stroke, most of the study right now showed no, cha no difference between surgical versus TAVR incidence of stroke. Initially, they were saying that TAVR has a little higher stroke, uh, but now, it's almost equal with, with the refined technique. Uh, the most important thing to remember about pacemaker, as you know, the uh, his bundle and the, uh, and, uh, and the conduction system is very close to the aortic valve annulus. So when you put, uh, uh, when you put the valve and you push the calcium, you push the native valve aside, you are causing pressure on the conduction system. So occasionally you can cause complete heart block. Especially the patient who have right bundle branch block. If you have right bundle branch block, it means you're conducting in the left bundle, is that right? So the, uh, the valve is very close to the left bundle. By, by deploying the valve and pushing the calcium against the, uh, the, uh, the annulus of the valve, you are putting a lot of pressure on the, uh, on the conduction system. So that can cause complete heart loss. If the patient does not have right bundle branch block, even if you have a left bundle branch block, the patient can still conduct enough with the uh, you know, right bundle. So a uh, patient who has right bundle branch block before procedure are really high risk for requiring a permanent pacemaker, and you have to watch it for that. Uh, about 10 to 15% of all patients with TAVR require a permanent pacemaker. The number sometimes is a little bit less now with a refined technique, but uh, uh, you know, and that's something they have to keep in consideration, especially with patients who have pre-existing right bundle branch block. And this is a little higher than the surgical aortic valve case. Of course, vascular injury, we are using 14 and 16 French uh, sheath in the, the artery. And this is the inner uh, lumen diameter of the sheath. The outer lumen is about two, two more. So if you put 16 French sheet, you are actually putting 18 French sheet. So this is a huge sheet and that can cause vascular injury. We use a closure device we call pre-close to try to close the artery with the suture uh, through the uh, percutaneous approach, uh, which really decreases the incidence of uh, vascular complication, but nevertheless, vascular complication is one of the major concerns. And it's one of the major things that we look into in our workup for aortic valve replacement is how is the vascular axis? What is the size of the femoral artery? the iliac artery, the aorta, and if there's any significant disease in this area because we have to advance very large capital. This is our valve coordinator before. So uh, the, in the valve clinic, uh, the, of course, we obtain an echo to get all this criteria we talk about, EKG to look at any pre-existing uh, conduction problem, uh, cardiac catheterization to evaluate for any uh, uh, coronary artery disease or any other uh, abnormality besides the aortic stenosis. The CT scan of the chest and abdomen uh, with a TAVR software to evaluate the size of the valve and the uh, vascular system. Uh, we do a carotid ultrasound, we do pulmonary function tests and all the lab, you know, including heart count and everything. In addition to that, we have something called uh, frailty assessment. So we assess the frailty of the patient as part of the requirement because the, the uh, Medicare or the insurance company require that you do this procedure on patient who is somewhat viable 
so uh, there's multiple method of uh, assessing frailty. I'm going to go through that quickly because of the time. So we have different methods. Of course, the, the more uh, the more frail the patient. I mean, frail is mean weak and with uh, Arab in uh, uh, and the recovery to patient going any less or risk is higher. In hospital course, after the procedure, most of the patients remain in the hospital 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we leave them within six hours after we remove all the sheets. Uh, we do an echocardiogram next day and in uh, one month and in one year. And usually they are all followed in the valve clinic or the cardiologist who did this procedure at least like one month and one year. Uh, valve clinic follow-up, we say 30 year, one year. We do echo to check how the valve functioning. We do EKG to see if there's any conduction abnormality. We do a physical exam to assess the condition of the patient. And we ask them about how their lifestyle, how the improvement in lifestyle uh, after you replace the valve. So I'm gonna show you an example of, uh, so this is the animation. I will put the valve. This is Edward. I'm sorry, I'm going to step aside to take a call and quickly I'll do that. I don't have one for the Medtronic. Unfortunately, Medtronic valve uh, is not working. The, the slide is not working. I'll try one more time. It's not loading anyway. This is in a real life. This is the actual patient. This is how the valve look. We, uh, when we deploy the valve, we have to do what we call rapid pacing. We pay the ventricle at 180 feet per minute. So the pressure drop to a significant drop, and the ventricle would be like more, almost five, uh, 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 like you're having a patient with a ventricular fibrillation, like the ventricle is barely moving. The reason we do that, because if the, if the ventricle is still moving, the valve will be moving up and, up and down, up and down, and we will not deploy the valve in the right position. Of course, Displacement of the valve is a disaster, you know, because then you have to open the patient up and do open heart surgery. So we do rapid pacing. We inject to verify the position of the valve. And then we inflate the balloon here. Uh, the slide is not playing to the end. Usually the balloon inflated all the way and the valve is deployed all the way. So this is an example of a patient who had uh, severe aortic stenosis. And then after the valve deployment, you see the strut of the valve, you know, the metal uh, reverberation. This is a prosthetic valve. Okay, so... Uh, 
One thing is the insurance company and the Medicare in the United States, you know, wants to know when you do this very expensive procedure, those were of course over thirty thousand dollars in the United States, like thirty, forty thousand dollars. So the procedure with the hospitalization and all of that is very expensive procedure. So they want to make sure that this is really improving the lifestyle and the quality of life and the uh, survival rate for the patient. So it is required by the insurance and by uh, Medicare to prove to them that we really did improve the lifestyle of those patients. So this is why we do the follow-up in one month and one year. We assess their functional class. We assess their ability to, uh, to do normal life task and uh, breathing and all kind of things. So I'm not going to bore you with this because it's detail related to the United States. But this uh, basically shows significant improvement in the lifestyle and the quality of life, the quality of life. OK. Um, this slide showing that TAVA right now taking over as the gold standard for aortic valve replacement. But I just want to give you a word of precaution. When do we do a TAVR right now? And when we do a surgical? Uh, TAVR is transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Surgical is called SAVR, surgical aortic valve replacement. Now, uh, of course, it's a room for uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. Most of the studies show right now, if a patient is younger than 65 years of age, maybe more appropriate for surgery, the reason why, if a patient, you put a TAVR valve in them at age less than 65, those valves, let's say an average life expectancy for the valve itself, you know, 10, maybe 12 years, and then you have to do another valve. You can do one valve and valve one time, but after that, you have to go and open the chest again and extend excise all the valve apparatus and which related extensive surgery and replace the valve surgically. So right now they're looking for the patient longevity to be in the upper 80s and maybe some people live to the 90s. So if a patient less than 65 years of age, uh, if the patient is a good surgical candidate, if they are a good surgical candidate, not very high risk surgery, they're probably better off with surgery. The other category of patient who really benefits from surgery also, a patient with bicuspid aortic valve. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot do TAVR on bicuspid, but the surgical result is a little bit better on bicuspid aortic valve, especially uh, those patients are actually younger patients than the other patient with a degenerative aortic valve stenosis. So on those patients, um, uh, surgical aortic valve replacement may be a better option. The third category where surgical aortic valve replacement is preferred over TAVR is patient who has concomitant severe coronary artery disease. A patient who has significant coronary artery disease plus the aortic valve uh, stenosis, those patients can have a combined surgery for aortic valve bypass surgery and aortic valve replacement. Although, although some of those patients, what we do is uh, if they have a disease in the coronary artery amenable or suitable for uh, stenting, so we do stent them first. We treat the coronary artery first, especially the major artery, and then do the TAVR. So it can be done with TAVR uh, with uh, addressing the coronary artery with angioplasty and stenting prior to TAVR. But if the patient has extensive disease and uh, disease in the coronary artery that's not very suitable for uh, stent, like severe left main disease or heavily calcified long lesion. So those patients will benefit from surgical aortic valve replacement plus bypass surgery. But uh, right now, the number of TAVR versus surgical is really uh, uh, high. And now also TAVR can be used in treating uh, bioprosthetic surgical valve that is deteriorating. So we can do is some what you call valve and valve. And the slide here showed from 2014, uh, the surgical uh, procedure was the most common. And now 10 years later, this slide go only to 2017. 
you see the tower and the green green uh, chart taking off and exceeding the surgery. So those statistics you really don't need to worry about. Uh, this is to show improvement in uh, lifestyle and class of heart failure. Okay. Uh, this is about pacemaker, uh, need for pacemaker. And as you see here, uh, like I told you, but between 10 to 15% of patients would require a pacemaker, permanent pacemaker transition. I think I'm gonna stop here and see if anyone has any question. Is there had a little question? Then he will coordinate her, but it's badly on who can job on a little show. Thank you.